Welcome to Phys Ed, brought to you by the Caregiver Space. Okay, today we're going to talk about heart rate. What does it mean when you're in your training zone? Why is it even important for your heart rate? Well, let's first talk about the winter. A couple of things going on here. We see that there's a lot of snow, especially here in the Northeast, out West. One of the things that you need to understand about your heart rate is that during certain activities, your heart rate's going to react differently. So, shoveling snow is a form of what we call anaerobic exercise. Anaerobic exercise means that your heart rate goes from here, standing heart rate, let's say 70, 80, and shoots up very quickly. And we need to stop that activity or exercise because we can't take in enough oxygen to sustain energy and to elongate that movement. Anaerobic exercise is when your heart is at most risk, whether you're fit, but especially if you're not fit. So think about it. It's cold outside. Your body's not warm. You're not stretched. You go outside. You start shoveling snow. You're not in that great a shape to begin with. So your heart rate's going to go from 80, 90, 100, 110, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. And when does it stop? Who knows? That's why, similarly, people that first start out with an exercise program, when they go on a treadmill, the same effect. Even though, in theory, running, jogging, or walking is aerobic, it's important to gradually raise your heart rate into any activity that you're doing, especially if you have risk factors, heart disease, and or you're not fit and getting your heart rate used to moving. That's critical. I always, when I meet with people, the first question I ask them is, were you fit as a child or a youth? And they're looking at me like, well, I'm 45, 50, 60 years old now. How does that matter? It matters because the body has a computer chip in it that says, wow, I remember when Ted used to be fit. Because Ted used to run track when he was in high school. So he's going to receive those benefits still. The body's going to react. After about three to four or five months, the body's going to say, hey, you know what, Ted? I remember when you used to be fit. I'm going to reward you. That's why I'm such a proponent of making sure that you're making your children exercise on a regular basis because the benefits and now all the medical data is supporting all these things I've been reading and writing about I should say writing about the last 20 years is that you are going to get that benefit later on in life because that time vested is going to extend and elongate your life heart rate let's first separate aerobic and anaerobic we hear it all the time what is aerobic exercise? Aerobic exercise means anything that we do that is continuous, meaning that we don't need to take a break. Walking, jogging, running for some people, swimming, jumping rope, rowing. These are all forms of what is called aerobic exercise, which means on a graph is that, let's say that your heart rate is 70 beats per minute, standing heart rate. So you're going to get on that treadmill or start your walk outside, and it's going to go up 70, 80, 90, 100, 110. And then after a couple of minutes, it does not keep rising, but it levels off. So what that means is that during the time of your aerobic movement and exercise, you can maintain a conversation somewhat comfortably. That's usually the other indication. Anaerobic exercise is any exercise that we need to take a break because we can't maintain that movement that we were doing. And they usually include smaller group muscles. You're working either your legs or your, just your chest or just your legs or just your arms. Weightlifting is a form of anaerobic exercise. Calisthenics, toning exercises, doing a jumping jack, meaning that our heart rate goes up but we have to stop at some point to catch our breath, and then we have to gradually decrease the intensity so that we're allowed to keep breathing. Some exercises act anaerobically for those that are unfit, even though on paper they're aerobic. For example, if you as a caretaker is unfit or not getting your heart rate used to moving, and let's say that you decide that you're going to go out and walk a mile. So you start walking after about 100 yards. It's like, oh, God, my heart rate's so high. What should I do? So on paper, it's aerobic, but it's really acting anaerobically because you're so unfit that your heart rate is not stopping and leveling off. It's still going up, up, up. And what you should do is slowly 
gradually stop and then resume. So the good thing is, is that anyone at any age, 50, 60, 70, 80, all of you can increase your aerobic capacity and all of you can get your heart rate to come down because the more fit you become, the stronger your heart becomes. Perfect example, if you walk a mile at 3.0 miles per hour and after three months, let's say you started out, your heart rate got up to 140. And we'll get into your heart rate in a second as far as what it should be during that mile. Three months later, you're walking that same, same mile at the same pace. Your heart rate's only 120. So you know your heart has improved. The good thing is, is that your heart has improved. The downside to that is that you need to increase intensity to burn the same amount of calories that you did when you were walking and your heart rate reached 140. Another way that you can gauge your heart rate as far as how hard you're working, there are many ways. You can go out and get a heart rate monitor, which is rather expensive, and you have to normally wear something around your chest, even though they do have ones you can wear around your wrist. I recommend people that have any type of heart issue or heart condition, or your doctor has advised you to monitor your heart rate because of the fact that you might run into some sort of difficulty, those are the people that should be wearing a heart rate monitor. If you fall in that classification, then of course listen to your health and doctor and practitioner. If you don't, another way is called perceived rate of exertion. Perceived rate of exertion is how hard do you think that you're working on a scale of one to 10 with anything that you're doing. So for instance, you ever walk up a flight of stairs and you're out of breath a little bit, you're probably feeling that perceived rate of exertion is a nine or an eight, maybe a 10. But if you were to just say do some housework around the house, you would rate your perception and your, your rate of perception to be, oh, I think, you know what, I'm only at a three. So that's another way that you can do it. What does your heart rate mean as far as being in your target zone? The best way is a very simple formula, is to take the number 220 and minus your age. So 220 minus 50 equals what? 170. What that 170 number means is that in theory, whether you are doing housework, whether you're jogging, shoveling snow, or any activity or exercise, you should probably not exceed 170 beats per minute because you might, not necessarily, but you might run into difficulty as far as breathing and, in, and any other respiratory or heart related issues. That's the high end of your zone. The low end of your zone should be 50, 60 to 70 percent depending upon how fit you are. So the rule of thumb is simple. If you are unfit, you want to start exercising towards the 50 percentile. So 50 percent of 170 is 85. Very simple. And you want to build up to 90 percent of that 170 number as you become more fit. Some people can derive benefit from being on the low end of their training heart rate if they're unfit and receive the same aerobic benefit and same cardiovascular benefit as a fit person who needs to be training at 80% to get the same benefit. And that's important because a lot of people say, well, I can only do something for two minutes. Well, you know what? That two minutes improved your cardiovascular condition and improved how your heart is working. And next week, maybe it's three minutes and then four minutes and then five minutes. So all these things matter. What does matter the most is that you're making some sort of an effort to get your heart stronger so that you're able to care for your loved one in a much more efficient and an effective manner and also maybe motivate your loved one who needs cardio fitness to get them started in a way that's safe and effective. All right, the next topic we're gonna get into, a subtopic of having to do with your heart rate is very simple. Let's say that you want to pick an exercise and you're not quite sure how your heart is going to react, what should you do? That's called the level of intensity. So for instance, if you're just starting out, you might want to start out on the 50 percentile of your maximum heart rate. Again, your age minus 220 equals the maximum heart rate that your heart should be beating beats per minute in any activity or exercise that you're doing. 
So let's say you're going to go shovel snow. How would you take, if you didn't have a heart rate monitor, how would you take your heart rate? Well, the best way is to take two fingers, put it over here under your neck, on your neck, under your chin, I should say, and you count how many beats for 10 seconds while you're timing yourself, and then you times it by six. So let's say that my heart rate is 20 beats for those 20 seconds. So now that would be six times 20. My heart rate is now 120 beats per minute with whatever I just got finished doing or during what I'm doing. That's why it's critical that in any movement and any exercise regimen that anyone's following at any time is the warm-up because the warm-up allows you to gradually bring your heart rate up so that when you later on put demands on it and it's going to go higher, it doesn't have to jump from a standing heart rate to 140. It's going to go from maybe 110, 120 because you warmed up only to 140, so the shock to the heart is not that much. All right, the best exercise is to improve your heart rate, to improve your cardiovascular system. Is anything aerobically meaning anything that we can do continuously without having to take a break? And those type of exercises are used for aerobic and cardiovascular conditioning. They are also used for losing weight. So that's important. I think we have a call coming in. I'm not quite sure. Right. I'll still chat to you while that call is being retrieved. First thing we want to do, of course, is to educate all the caregivers and the wonderful people out there right now that are helping themselves and helping their loved ones. Hello, this is Phys Ed, Edward Joukowsky. How are you? Hi, this is Patty. I have a question for you regarding, um, I take care of my elderly mother. She's 83 years old. She's a little bit overweight and has been diagnosed with diabetes. Um, what can I do to keep her healthy so that she can keep moving? She doesn't use a walker or a wheelchair or anything, but I want to keep her moving. How's her motivation? Let's start with that. Not very motivated, not uh, very much at all. How's your motivation to get her moving? Oh, how's my motivation? It's great. I, I mean, I can challenge her to get up and, and move around. So, uh, walk. so you're, you're in a position where whatever I recommend for you to do, that you're going to be able to follow through. Because that's important. Because it's great that I can tell you what to do. But what's even more equally important is getting a participant. Look, you know as well as I know that when, when you hear the word exercise, people run to the hills. They want to have nothing to do with it. So what do you do with a person that's kind of lazy-ish? They're not that motivated. The best thing you can do is keep them seated while they're exercising. Does your mom like to watch TV? Yes. Okay. Well, here's the perfect thing. You can go out and order online today a recumbent bike. It's a bike that, in which you sit in that supports your back and your knees. And she could be flipping away while she's moving on that. And she could just move with a couple of minutes a day or a couple segments during the day. See how her heart reacts. Get one with a heart rate monitor built in. They're very inexpensive today. You can pick up a good recumbent bike today for a couple hundred dollars. And then what you do is, while she's watching TV, you're there next to her say, Mom, pedal for a minute. Every commercial for this show, I want you to pedal slowly. Gauge your heart rate, see what it is, write it down, and in two weeks, that same amount of time, her heart rate is going to come down, and she's going to feel more motivated. You're going to say, all right, Mom, now it's two minutes. Now it's four minutes. So that's the best way, Patty, that you can motivate your mom. And on the other nice thing about having that is you can do it. And her watching you do that as well is also going to motivate her because she's like, oh, Patty's doing it. You know what? I'm going to do it. And so everyone in, the, in this family, the support group, whether it be eating properly, whether it be exercising, whether it be getting her to start a new hobby or dropping a bad habit, the more support that she can have and the more education she can have is going to result in longer lasting and adherence to a fitness program. Okay? Okay. I hope that helps you. 
All right. So that was a great question because the motivation is very, very important. And I think that what we should be doing is paying attention to not just what people need to be doing, but the motivational aspect. Do we have another call coming in? I think we do. Hello, Phys Ed. Welcome to Phys Ed. Yeah, hi there. Love the show, Ed. Uh, Thank my name's you. Todd. Um, I'm a uh, 45-year-old guy, and um, I, I think I'm pretty healthy, but I, uh, I have a family history of heart problems, and I just want to make sure I'm kind of on the right track so I can be around to take care of my family. Okay. Well, the first question I'm going to ask you is, are you overweight? No, I'm. Uh, I think I'm right in right in the in a good spot. I'm like good. five ten, one sixty. I say good because the fact that you're doing this for health reasons, not aesthetic reasons. More on the health. Before? More on the health end. Am I correct, Todd? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'd say that. It doesn't change your mode of exercise, by the way. But remember, it doesn't matter what your motivation is. You're choosing to do this because you want to live longer and you want to, of course, get stronger and, and care for your loved one. So the go. first thing I'm going to ask you is, how are your knees, how are your back? How's your knees, how are your back? Um, pretty good. Okay. I think I'm, I'm pretty solid in both Have times. you ever tried walking quickly or jogging? Yeah, I, I'd say I usually jog like once a week. Okay. So the first thing you can do, are you stretching as well, I hope? Uh, yeah, I do a little stretching before and after. Good. So you want to, because you're not overweight, you don't need to do it more frequently, more than three days a week. A person who's not overweight and is in good health can get away with vigorous exercise, but you have to do a full body regimen three days a week. And it sounds like that you've got two out of the five components of fitness, and they are flexibility, cardiovascular, you got those covered, but you're not doing anything for strength and you're not doing anything for endurance and body ratio. So I would recommend is three changes and three additions. One, you need to do it more often. Two, you need to include maybe some push-ups. And if you're not strong enough to do them on your toes, start out on your knees. You've already got the flexibility component intertwined in your workout routine, which is great. Do some core work, and then you've got a full pie. The pie is going to rise, and you've done everything that you can do. You've got to keep increasing your intensity and, and or elongated the amount of time that you're running because to be able to burn those blood sugars and burn, burn those lipids and cleanse your body, you want to make sure that you're doing a whole full body workout program. Great. Hey, thanks a lot. I appreciate yeah, that. Good question, by the way. Thanks for calling in. Okay. So, what we've learned from these last two callers is two different people, two different dilemmas, both caretakers. One is trying to help her mom because she knows that statistically, if I work out and I sweat, I'm going to burn those blood sugars through aerobic exercise. And the other person is a person who's semi-fit, wants to do more, and is doing part of it, but is only getting the C in gym class. And that person, Todd, wants to get the A in gym class. And you get the A in gym class by following a protocol. You warm up, you stretch, you workload, you cool down. It all affects your heart rate. You make sure that you are exercising in a fashion so that you get to control the intensity. And that, I'm going to leave everyone with this. We have another call, I understand, okay? Who's on the line? This is Edward Joukowsky. Welcome to Phys Ed. Hello. Hello. Um, I had a question. Okay. Um, if you've only got an hour to work out, how much time should you spend of that hour warming up and cooling down? And how high of a heart rate should you have during that time? Okay. First question I'm going to ask you is, is your main goal to tone or is it to lose weight? More to tone. Okay. All right. What is your first name? Um, I'm having a hard time hearing you. What was the question? Okay. Who am I speaking with? What is your name? Um, Yolanda. Hi, Yolanda. Okay, so Yolanda, you can either stay on the line or hang up. I'm going to answer your question. The rule, yes. of, the rule of thumb for if you have an hour of how much time do you warm up and how much time do you cool down has to do with what your goals are and how fit you presently are. The more fit you are, the shorter the warm-up can be. But you need to take a look at your goals. In other words, your goal is to want to tone up. So you want to ride the bike with more resistance 
and less time, maybe 15, 20 minutes for your warm up, which you're also getting aerobic benefit during that time. And then at the end, two to three minutes of cooling down at a very slow pace so that your heart rate cools down, which means comes down. Your heart rate for a person that is semi-fit should be between 70% of your maximum heart rate. Are you still on the line, Yolanda? Yeah, I'm still how, on the line. So how, how, how much time should you spend on stretching, though? I mean, shouldn't you stretch? Well, we'll get that. We'll, we'll get to, yes. Well, no, no. We'll get to that in a second. But what is your age, please? Um, it's okay. No one's going to know who you are. Yes. Okay, so how old are you? I'm 47. Okay, well, that's critical to know your maximum heart rate. So, again, let's take 50 minus 220, 170, add 3. 173 is your maximum heart rate. So you want to okay. take 70% of that number, 173, and that's the bottom baseline number that your heart rate should be so that you're able to receive health, fitness, and aesthetic benefits. Now, most people think that they stretch beforehand. I think that's what you said before. Should, are you asking me sh when to stretch or when do you think you should stretch? I mean, should you warm up first and stretch a little bit or should you stretch right from the start? Where does stretching fit in all of it? Well, stretching, well, that's a great question. There are four phases to a workout. Warm up in this order. Stretch, two, three, workload, four, cool down. Let me give you an example. Have you ever watched the Summer Olympics when the sprinters are getting ready to sprint and what's the first thing they do they jog around the track right mm -hmm. and then they stretch and then they get on the starting line and then they're off and running so think about it if a world-class athlete has to warm up first then stretch obviously the average person like you or I we're gonna follow that same suit that same suit is a medical standard that has been established through the American College of Sports Medicine nearly a hundred years ago. The problem is, is that no one wants to adhere to it. People think, oh, you don't need to stretch. Oh, there's no evidence. Oh, let me tell you something. When an Olympic athlete and all Olympic athletes and athletes around the world stop warming up and stretching, maybe then that's when I'll do it. So the answer is warm up first because your muscles are cold. And when you stretch them, they're going to react more positively to them. Also, if you stretch and you overstretch and your muscles are warm, you also have a lower chance of pulling that muscle. People don't understand that the purpose of warming up and stretching is not to prevent injury. It's really to prevent serious injury. So if your body's warmed up and stretched and you overextend yourself or you lift too much of a weight, instead of tearing a muscle, Maybe you're only pulling a muscle. And a lot of people don't understand that, and they don't see the value of that. Also, from your heart perspective, warming up, the more intense your exercise, you want to ease into it. You don't want to just take your heart rate, Yolanda, and go from standing heart rate of 70 or 80 beats per minute and jack it up to 170 beats within 30 seconds. You want to gradually get it up there so that you can exercise safely and effectively. The other thing is, from a motivational perspective, your heart rate. If you're going to work out and then all of a sudden you're out of breath, most people today are not that motivated and that educated and have that much stamina and mental toughness and tenacity to say, oh my God, people panic. They get anxiety attacks. Oh, I'm, I'm working too hard. I'm breathing hard. Well, you are working hard and you are receiving benefit. But you know what? You've got your insurance policy right next to you. You warmed up. You stretched. You're challenging your system. And now you can even be more intense because your body is getting used to it. So I hope that was helpful to you. That's a perfect answer. Thank you. I, that's what I was looking for. That makes sense. And I think it's better, too, to instead of just going at full speed, to take your time and warm up to that speed. And then I think exercise is more fun that way, too. Well, listen, a great question. I think we educated a lot of people with that call. And thank you for calling in, by the way. Okay, thanks for that. Thank you so much for all your information that you share. Sure, appreciate well, it. Well, thanks. Bye. We, we appreciate you. So, you know, the caregiver space, which brings you this programming on, you know, coach ed and phys ed and all this, it's all about, remember, getting yourself and putting yourself in the strongest position possible to take care of yourself 
so that you're able to have the mental toughness, the physical toughness, to deal with a loved one and all the curveballs that that loved one throws to you, at you every day. It's difficult, I know it is. It's very difficult, especially whenever you want to motivate someone to do something. And I think the best way that you can do is a trial and error. You know, the hard approach, the soft approach, the loving approach. Whatever you need to do, as long as it's honest, moral, and ethical, to get yourself moving and get your loved one in a better place physically, that's the name of the game. I can't wait to join you again in our next live stream. And again, this is, you know, the Coach Ed, Phys Ed, brought to you by the Caregiver Space. And please keep your questions coming, and thank you for tuning in today.